Welcome to the Lifeline Health Lecture. I would like to start with a question. Have you ever known a winter, a real winter, like in Chicago, for example? Or have you ever known a summer, a real summer, like in Florida, hot and muggy? Well, I believe most of the people, especially in this country, have quite a, well a good idea about what's a good winter and what's a good hot summer. Now, would it occur to any one of you to run around in a cold, freezing winter night in, uh, in Chicago, run around there with summer clothing from Florida that you use down there in the summer? Would you do that? Well, I guess you wouldn't, would you? Because you know you would get sick and you would probably freeze to death in the night. Now, would it occur to you to go to Florida and then in the hot summer sun during the day run around there with all these hot uh, winter clothing that you usually use in Chicago in, in the winter? Would you do that? No, you wouldn't do that either, would you? Because you know that a heat stroke would probably kill you. Well, we are very used to adapt to the different climate condition, to the different temperatures, and we do that every year because we go through these different cycles, and so we know we have to constantly change our clothing. But what we do not notice is, or most of us have not noticed is, that the conditions, the living conditions on this planet Earth have changed completely. And if we do not adapt to them, then we, they will kill us. Just like summer clothing would kill you in Chicago and winter clothing would give you heat stroke in uh, Miami. So we can't just keep going the way we, we did because the conditions have changed. And that is the reason why disease is increasing in such a dramatic way. We have more and more physicians every day, so it's not the health care that is, or the lack of health care that is uh, responsible for the increase in all these uh, epidemic uh, diseases. The, 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 let's say the, the, um, the condition that is provoking all this, we rather have to uh, find it in our environment because we still live as we used to live decades ago. Now, let me have a look with you uh, at these different conditions that we are encountering right now. And I would like to call this session why do we get sick? Why do, you, do we get sick? You know, it's interesting. You, don't, you go to the physician and you ask him why you got diabetes or, or why you have a cancer or why you got this or why you got that, and he usually does not have an answer. I just yesterday asked somebody that came to see me, I said, listen, if your car was broken down, and you would take it to the mechanic, and you would ask the mechanic, listen, can you tell me why this car broke down? It's not running in it. What's, what's going on? And if that, that mechanic would tell you, well, I don't really know, but just leave it here. I'll fix it for you. Would you accept that mechanic? Well, you probably wouldn't because you expect the mechanic to know why that car is not working and, and uh, what was the problem with the car that, it's, uh, that it uh, uh, is not uh, in good conditions anymore. Well, but when we go to the doctor, we ask the doctor, well, doctor, can you tell me why I am sick? He'll say, no, I don't know why you are sick, but don't worry, I can fix you. Well, if he was a mechanic, we wouldn't leave the car there. 
But because we don't care as much for our body, or we have been trained uh, to, to uh, deal with our bodies in a different way than we do with our cars, that's why we turn our body over to the physician and say, well, all right, do what you can and see whether you can fix me. And then he'll probably come up with a chronic disease. But, uh, you know, it's not my desire to put down the medical profession because they have, we have a real need for them. There is no doubt about it. And they have a reason for their existence and praise the Lord for good doctors. But um, why do we get sick? We should know that. And even if the doctor doesn't know it, you yourself should know it because you are responsible for your body. Now, let's look at this here. If you want to make a trip from here to New York or any other place in this country and you would be using a new car, then it would probably not be very difficult to get there. You just get on the car, make sure you got your credit card with you and you're on your way and you will get there. Uh, unless you have a, a bad accident or something like that, you will get there. But what if you want to travel in one of these old cars here? What a difference to travel in a quite used car. Special, med, uh, uh, special mechanical care, emergency services, extra travel funds, and many other things we have to take care of in order to get with this car to our destiny. It's uh, funny to me. You know, we all have a body and not everyone has a car. But we all know more about cars than we do about our body. And if I want to explain something, I need to go to the car in order for people to understand it. It's really sad, isn't it? If a mechanic would try to explain something that happens with a car and use a body as an example, well, that would be wonderful. But that it's the other way around is not all that good because it just tells us how ignorant we are usually when it comes to health. But now anyway, if you want to travel in your life from a little baby to a, to a senior, then you have to take quite some things in consideration nowadays if you want to get there. Because right now, little babies that are born right now, they have uh, only a very slight chance, really, to make it up to old age. Because many babies are uh, already born sick. Many die before they are eight, nine years old. Uh, they suffer from all kinds of diseases that usually only elderly people would get. So it is very difficult let's say the least, to uh, make it from childhood to, uh, to uh, a senior citizen. Now, there are two different factors that we need to take in consideration because the ones that we need to take in consideration is first planet Earth and then our body. Now, let's dedicate this lecture to the first factor, to planet Earth. What has happened to planet Earth? The Earth, 60, 70 years ago, used to be a very alkaline planet. This planet was very nicely alkaline, and that was perfect for us because we have an alkaline body that constantly produces acidity, but it was living in an alkaline world. Wonderful. But now we have managed to make this planet Earth acidic. And the trip of our lives on this planet Earth is much more difficult now. Around 70 years ago, it was still in pretty good conditions. That was like at the end of the Second World War. But since then, it has aged rapidly, starting with the process of industrialization and motorization, causing and 
causing acid rain and many other environmental problems. You have all heard about the acid rain that has been falling for probably 50 years or even a little bit more now. So in, I remember there was a time in Germany when a lot of woods or forests, they were just all brown. They were all dead. They, all the trees had died because of the acid rain. It was terrible to view. And it has kept going. We have tried to keep a little bit control on it, but it, we have not been really very successful with it. So we have managed to acidify these planet Earths in such a tremendous way that about five or six years ago, the, world's health, the World Health Organization published that the oceans that are usually very alkaline, they usually have a pH around 8, that the oceans now are so acidic that they are bleaching the coral reefs all over the world. Now, this acidity in the oceans is runoff from the continents because that's here, it's here on the, on the continents where we produce all these acidic rain. And not only that, we even have a produced, we even have produced a hole. And look here, I got some pictures of the different sizes of the ozone hole over the Antarctic. You can see here a hole in 1999. In 2000, we used to have the biggest one. But right now, the one in 2011, and this hole occurs during the winter months here. And uh, so just last winter, it was almost as big as in the year 2000. And even the one in 2010, which was one of the smallest holes that we have had, even the hole from 2010 was bigger in size than the whole North American continent. So that's a big hole. And why is it so important that, uh, what, what's, what's important about the ozone? Why does it hurt us if there is a hole in the ozone layer? Well, the ozone layer catches usually the ultraviolet B rays from the, or beta rays from the, from the sun, while the alpha rays will usually come through. They are the ones that will give us the tang. But the, the beta rays should not be coming through. They should be absorbed by the ozone layer. But now they get through and they produce a lot of different health problems. They produce skin cancer, they produce cataracts, and they weaken our immune system. And because it is on the, over the Antarctic, so the hole is much closer to South America than to North America, the, uh, the, the effects of these ozone holes are more noticeable in Latin America than here in the United States. And they do have quite an increase in skin cancer in Latin America, and it might just as well have to do with these holes. And cataracts also have become quite common now. And uh, the immune system, well, who has a functioning immune system anymore? If you have a functioning immune system, you must be sick because everybody has a broken down immune system nowadays. That's, of course, wonderful because that way they can sell a lot of vaccines. But anyway, these beta rays, they will also affect the microorganism in the water. And remember, I told you in, uh, in the lecture that we had on, uh, on oxygen that in the water, 70% uh, or at least 60% of the oxygen is produced from the algae there. And now this ozone is affecting these marine life. That is really a health hazard for us. And we need to be aware of all these things. But let's come down from the uh, stratosphere to the troposphere, where we have the development of rain down here. And now with all these industries that we have, industries and cities and, 
and cars, every bit where we're burning carbon fuels. And that produces a lot of um, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. And all these gases, they will go into the air, and then it starts raining, and they will combine with the rain, and then we get the acidic rain. The acidic rain will damage the life on this planet. It made the planet very acidic by now, and it's really a terrible situation. You know that the carbon dioxide uh, content in our atmosphere right now is 190 ppm, while it should never have passed uh, beyond 150 ppm. So right now we're in a very dangerous situation because of this carbon dioxide content in our atmosphere. And scientists say that our planet right now is in a condition like a person five minutes before a heart attack. So that might give you a little idea where we are standing with the condition of our environment, brothers and sisters. Now, there is really nothing that is not contaminated. It's not only the troposphere and the stratosphere and, and, uh, and even above the atmosphere. We have now uh, debris flying around there from all these uh, uh, satellites that we have shot into space. Well, but even up on, the, on the ground here, we have a lot of uh, problems. Look at the roads. Look all the garbage you find uh, very often next to the road. Uh, then our beaches, our lakes, our rivers. Everything is contaminated. Here we have an interesting thing. This here is a drainage that is coming out. Where you see that, that uh, this uh, arrow th there on the top, uh, to the left, there is a drain pipe coming out. And the water is dripping down here. And so the lower uh, uh, arrow is showing the foam that is produced from this drainage water that is running down there. This is unbelievable. And who has produced all this? Well, it's us. Because when we wash our clothes, we couldn't care whether that uh, um, detergent is uh, uh, biodegradable de de uh, or not. We, well, just let's just get the cheapest and the biggest one, and, and uh, well, it's quite cheap, so let's put two cups instead of one into that water. And we never think that this water with all these detergents got to end up somewhere. It's not going to disappear because it doesn't disappear in the in the washing machine, it runs out. So somewhere it's going to end up. And the most uh, likely thing is that sometimes, somehow, it will end up in our drinking water because down there is where our drinking water comes from, in the underground. And that's where most of the water goes. And if it doesn't go there, it goes down into the oceans. So we are really contaminating our uh, planet as much as we can. Well, let me go back to this picture from, the, uh, from here, from our own country, because we got all this mess here in a country where they usually come and pick up garbage twice a week. But have you noticed, for example, in your neighborhood, if you live, live in, a, in an urban area, that when the people come there to, to mow your lawn and there's all that plastic on these, on these lawns, well, they won't pick up the plastic. Oh, no, we don't have time for that. We just go over there and that lawnmower, it'll really chop it up fine. Well, it does, and you usually can't even see it anymore, even though most of the stuff you can still see it. But whatever happens to it, uh, it will little by little break down with the sun rays, but it will not disappear to bio, uh, biologically disintegrate or uh, chemically to in disintegrate, that takes thousands of years. So all this plastic, it's still there. And now we got it all uh, chopped up fine, and so the water can transport it, the wind can transport it. And right now, our oceans are more a soup of plastic than anything else. And we got so many little plastic particles in our oceans right now that the fish start feeding on them because they are about the size of algae, they're very little, and the fish can't distinguish. 
So when you eat fish, you eat probably uh, a, a lot of plastic there too. And of course, these plastic got to make this fish sick and uh, in some cases even kill it. So we have really produced a tremendous mess on this planet. In the uh, uh, Pacific Ocean, we have an area where uh, different currents come together and we have a patch of plastic underwater there that is the size of the state of Texas. Now imagine how much plastic that must be. I don't know how high it is, but the size is the size of the state of Texas. Well, but we keep throwing all this plastic away because... Uh, it will disappear. Of course it will. It will disappear, but it will, we will disappear with it because it's going to kill us, this stuff. Now, this here is another picture just to give you an idea how it looks in other countries. And I just, when I put this thing here together, I had somebody looking at it uh, uh, saying, oh, I, I was a missionary in India. And in many places, it just looks like that over there. Well, I did missionary work in, uh, in Africa and, and Mozambique. And uh, many places you have situations like this. It just gets all dirty. And then once there comes a good uh, rainstorm, then we have like almost like little mini floods there. And they'll wash it all away. All goes into the ocean. Well, here is another situation. This is a river from uh, somewhere in Asia, I, I, I did forget the name of the country. Somebody sent me these pictures. And uh, so look at this river here. I mean, this is not a little river. This is a big river. And look how this thing is covered with garbage. This man here, he is trying to, uh, to uh, make his living, but not anymore with fish, but with garbage that he can still uh, sell. And look at this river down here with all these dead fish. The guy is still picking the fish up. What they do with them, I don't have no idea. Maybe uh, turning in, into a fish meal for their cattle or whatever. But I mean, this is the situation of our planet Earth. And we are not aware of it because we are so busy working and paying our quotes for our payments for our car and, and, and to credit card bills and all these things, we don't have time to look at all this. And we just keep living as if we were, uh, if it was 70 years earlier. Well, we are living on a, contem a com completely contaminated uh, uh, planet right now. Now, these here were pictures that also were sent to me, and uh, they came with the note that this happened in the uh, in the Mississippi Delta at the oil spill, the BP oil, sp oil spill over there. I have not been able to verify these pictures. I hope they are true. And if they are not true, uh, then it must have happened somewhere else. But I do believe that it's probably true. And so this is all marine life that was killed, that's swimming here on top. I mean... Do you think that only marine life is going to, to get killed in, with all the toxicity of this uh, 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 planet that we will survive all these things? Well, some of us probably will, but most of us won't. So it will affect us. Then here we have another situation, and specifically here in the United States. The Tuff University in Boston, Massachusetts, they discovered that the contamination with antibiotics in the United States is a thousand times higher than in Germany. Listen, it's not doubled, it's not tripled, it's thousand times higher. Do you know what that means? That the contamination with antibiotics here is tremendous. And where does it come from? Well, because we feed all our turkeys and all our chickens and our, all our cattle and our pigs, we feed all these livestock with this tremendous amount of gross hormones to make them grow. And then they grow so fast that they get sick, so they have to add a huge amount of antibiotics to their feed 
so in order to keep these animals alive. So they get fed antibiotics every, all the time. If you eat a piece of chicken or, or, or a piece of turkey, you probably get as much uh, antibiotics as, as getting an, an, an injection. You may say, oh, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, I got a cold, so instead of getting injection, I'm going to get a piece of chicken, right? Well, I don't think uh, that is a good idea because um, these uh, antibiotics might not work uh, specifically against your flu virus, or they don't work against virus anyway, uh, against your um, whatever cold you got or whatever bacterial infection you have there. It might not precisely work, but they will work against one thing, and that I can guarantee you, that they will work against the good bacteria, the friendly bacteria that we have in our body. Do you know that we have in our intestines bacteria that produces vitamin B12 that especially all the vegans are so concerned about? I don't know why, but they are. So we have vitamin B producing bacteria in our intestinal tract and in our mouth and in, in lots of other places in our body. We have bacteria that produces other kinds of vitamins like uh, K and, and uh, other things. So uh, if we take, eat these things, we are going to kill these friendly bacteria. We also have bacteria in our intestinal tract that help us with the digestion, especially to break down fiber. So all these uh, bacteria will be affected by the use of, uh, of these kind of animal products. Look at this thing here. Shane Snyder from the Michigan State University uh, found enough estrogen, mostly from birth control pills, in lake meat to cause male fish to produce female egg protein and to attempt to lay eggs that they were not equipped to lay. Disbelieving the results, Mr. Snyder repeated the test 30 times. So in Lake Mead, we got so much estrogen from birth control pills that the, fee, that the male fish are turning into females. We have the, I saw a, a very similar report from a doctor, from, a researcher from Canada, from a river up in Canada, where there was just one male fish for 100 females. And they also found out that it was the content of estrogen. Now, we have taken so many birth control pills because they are the ones that contain the estrogen. We have taken so many birth control pills that we have been contaminating the entire environment. That's unbelievable. And we wonder why we have all these homosexuals and lesbians there. I believe they are very likely also um, a victim of the contamination that we have provoked in our environment. Each year in the United States, we produce 400 billion pounds of synthetic organic chem chemicals. They are all toxic. This is equivalent to 80 pounds of chemicals per year for every person on the planet. And why organic? Why would we produce this many organic uh, synthetic substances? Because they are usual, they are mostly for human consumption in foods, vitamins, uh, cosmetics, and, 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 and many, many other things. That's what we put them in. So, a big amount of these 400 billion pounds, we're eating it with our foods. We are putting it on our body and absorbing them percutaneous, which means through the skin. It's a terrible situation. We never think about that. Do you ever think about what's happening if you put the deodorant under your arm and the, and the, the, uh, the perfume in your face and the cream in your hair and, and the lotion on your body and the, the toothpaste in your mouth and all this stuff contains chemicals? Have you ever thought about what happens 
to you if you do these kind of things or if you wash all your clothes with these extra detergents and chemicals that make it smell good and that make it soft and that make it this and make it that. And all this stuff is absorbed by your clothes and you put in a drying machine, it can't get anywhere. It stays in there, it impregnates your, your, your clothing, your beds, beds and everything. And then you go to bed in all these nice smelling bad sheets, right? Yeah, they're full with chemicals and you lay in there all night long absorbing all these chemicals. And the morning you get out of the sheets and you get into these fresh uh, smelling clothes, of course, nothing has been dried out in the sun. It's, that's much too much work, and we don't have the space where to do it anymore anyway. So we put the clothes on our body, and all day long we are absorbing all these chemicals. Have you ever looked at the label of a bread? This here is a bread that is made in a factory, and this is a supermarket bread. Look at the difference. There's no difference at all. I haven't counted these, uh, these ingredients here, but usually uh, they have somewhere 25, 30. There are about 40 different chemicals that are registered as bread additives. A bread doesn't have more than, shouldn't have more than four ingredients, but not 30 or 40 ingredients. These are all chemicals. Now, you eat any kind of uh, bakery product right now and you are for sure putting down a seed for, a next, for the next cancer. That these are, each slice is a seed for a cancer. We cannot eat these products anymore. And why is there nothing else out there? Because we don't ask for it. And in fact, we are so used to the taste and the texture and the texture and the moisture and all that these chemicals produce, that real bread, we hardly like it anymore. It doesn't taste like bread anymore to us. We have forgotten the taste of bread. And this is just one of the few food uh, items that come from a factory. It's a terrible situation. We keep living on like nothing was happening. 80,000 food additives are, 8,000, sorry, food additives are registered with the World Health Organization right now. They are anti-caking agents, stabilizers, anti-foaming agents, firming agents, azo dyes, flavoring agents like MSG that you find almost everywhere. Bleaching agents, gelling agents, bulking agents, glazing agents, emulsifier, packaging gases, um, preservatives, emulsifiers. Some of them are used during the process of, of uh, um, manufacturing and some of the process of packaging, like packaging gases. They, they pack it with gas so that no fungus and no bacteria, nothing, nothing can grow in there. Make and create a good, um, a good toxic environment so that nothing can grow in there. And you will be able to keep this stuff on the shelf for months. All these little things that you find on the shelves out there in the supermarket that you know it has milk and sugar, you know these things and you know that they will rot so how would you then think about eating that after it had been for days and days on the, on the, um, on the shelf? Why would you want to eat that stuff? You know it will rot unless they put a lot of chemicals in there that will keep them from rotting. We have all kinds of to food intolerances that we suffer now. And in fact, they're so big, they've categorized them already. We have non-immunological -immun toxicity, which means it doesn't affect our immune system. Then we have immunological toxicity, affects our immune system. We have immediate uh, toxicity. We have toxicity that's delayed. You have to accumulate a little bit of this stuff in your body before it's going to work. Then we have 
physiological effects and we have psychological effects. It doesn't only affect your body, it will affect your mind too. And uh, I will tell you something that affects your mind, quite a few things in, in a minute. So then we have neurobehavioral uh, reactions att attributed to food allergies. Now just look at this list here. And I bet there's not one person out there that has not experienced at least three or four of these uh, different uh, food allergies that, uh, or, or symptoms of food allergies. We got migraine, sluggishness, nervous tick, nervousness, depression, blurred vision, feeling of unreality, inability to concentrate, paranoid ideas, irrational behavior, dizziness, fatigue, irritability, uh, hypertension, uh, fetophobia, neuralgia, transition blindness, trans, transient, transient, transient blindness, and seizures, insomnia, tachycardia, recurrent uh, neuro 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 neurotics. All right, so nervous problems. Now, this is a big list of, uh, of uh, problems, of symptoms that are produced by all these food additives. But we keep eating them. We hardly ever read the label. We all know they sell in the supermarket. Got to be good. Well, I can't go through all of them because, as you saw already, there are 8,000. We want to study them all. It would probably take us a couple of years. But I would like to mention one, and that is aspartame because it is a tremendously used product. It's a sugar substitute. Now, we all know that sugar is cheap already, but this is even cheaper than sugar. And that's why they like to use it, because even if you save one-tenth of a penny, if you sell a million, it makes money too. So aspartame is the technical name, and it's sold in Equal and, and uh, NutraSweet and all kinds of different uh, commercial names. And it is used in all kinds of different foods. You cannot see that here already on the list. Aspartame can be found in Instant breakfast, breast mints, cereals, shake mixes, soft drinks, frozen desserts, tea beverages, juice beverages, lax laxatives, juice beverage, um, pharmaceuticals and supplements, topping mixes, uh, milk drinks, yogurt, sugar-free, chewing gums. Now, there's a something interesting, these sugar-free chewing gums. They all contain aspartame. No, sorry. They all contain, contain phenylalanine. You'll see the word on the screen in a minute. Write that word down and look at your chewing gum and see whether it doesn't contain phenylalanine. And then you'll learn what that will do to you. Well, let's uh, pass these lists and let's go to the next one. This product, aspartame, accounts for over 75% of adverse food reactions reported to the Food and Drug Administration, FDA. Over 90 symptoms are associated with it. The following diseases can be triggered or worsened by ingesting of aspartame. Brain tumors, MS, which is multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, chronic fatigue, Parkinson. Alzheimer's, mental retardation, lymphoma, birth defects, fibromyalgia, and diabetes, and probably a lot more. Now, can you imagine that about 75% of all the calls that the FDA gets about um, uh, adverse food reactions, which means that somebody got sick from a food, 70% of the calls have to do with aspartame. And they don't take that stuff off the market. I can't really understand that. Why? I mean, there got to be some big money behind that stuff that they will tolerate it and not take it out. But if you want to sell uh, 
natural mint leaves as a tea, then you got to get a license for it or uh, um, vitamins or whatever. So um, it's difficult to understand the politics that we have in place here sometimes. So uh, let's uh, have a look what it's made of. It contains aspartic acid, phenylalanine, that's the word that I just mentioned, methanol. Now, the first two amino acids, natural products, well, amino acids are natural product. Sweet, when taken in its free form, phenylalanine is probably the sweetest. So the first two, these here, aspartic acid and phenylalanine, these are amino acids. So they are part of proteins. But we, in nature, they never exist in their free form. And when they are in their free form, then they are sweet. Because protein, meat isn't sweet. Eggs aren't sweet, are they? So when they are free, they are sweet. But they have tremendous health uh, uh, problems. Let's go to methanol. It's recommended limit, limited consumption uh, per day is recommended of 7.8 milligram per day. So we should never get more than 7.8 milligram per day. That's what the government says. A one quart aspartame sweetened beverage contains 56 milligrams of methanol. So how can they then allow somebody to sweeten um, a soda with aspartame? If, if you drink that one quart of soda, you get 57 um, milligrams of, uh, of methanol if, when you should not have more than 7.8. So how is that possible? So heavy users of aspartame um, containing of heavy users of aspartame com containing broad products may consume as much as 250 milligrams per day of methanol or 32 times the EPA limit and no control. Well, friends, I tell you, if you want to live healthy, you better take charge of the foods and the stuff that you put into your mouth. You need to learn what's in there. We can't put all these chemicals into ourselves. Of course, the chemical industries, they're happy because first they put all the chemicals in the food to make you sick, and then they come uh, through the doctor and say, oh, that's wonderful. Listen, we can help you now. We got some other chemicals here that will make you healthy again. Well, we know already that it doesn't work. That's why we got all these chronic diseases nowadays. Now, what, does, what do these amino acids do? Aspartic acid in its free form raises blood plasma levels of aspartate and glutamate, which are both excitotoxins. So kids go berserk and adults, adults get depressed. So these no-sugar added products they will make you depressed and kids, they will just go berserk with it. And then we wonder why they start shooting each other in school or why they uh, um, just go out there and beat each other up. Phenylalanine. Now, here is this thing that is in almost all the chewing gums. Phenylalanine. Excessive levels in the brain can reduce the serotonin neurotransmitter level in the brain. Syn uh, schizophrenics have low levels of serotonin. So what the phenylalanine does, it will reduce the, ser the serotonin level in your brain and you will become schizophrenics. Now, schizophrenics can kill you. And this is probably one of the reasons why children get so aggressive nowadays. Because as you saw already, all the different products that they have, these uh, aspartame in that contains phenylalanine, it's unbelievable. And all the desserts, all the sweet stuff, it's in everything almost. Because it is sweeter, it is cheaper than sugar. So don't wonder if kids beat each other up if we feed them with all these toxic stuff. 
Now here we got a few more, just two more of the food additives that I would like to mention. The antioxidants, they are put on snack foods like chips to exact, do exactly the same, lower the serotonin level by 40%. Kids eat these foods in their break, become aggressive, and kick each other to pieces and turn into schizophrenics. Why do they use these antioxidants? Didn't we learn in nutrition that antioxidants are the good guys, that they fight against the free radicals? Well, these are not so good guys. They are also antioxidants, but they are not natural uh, antioxidants. They are chemicals, synthetic antioxidants. And what they do is, have you ever cut a potato in half and put it on the table? What happens after just a few minutes? Doesn't it get brown? Yes, exactly. It will start to oxidize. And how do you think they keep these wonderful um, potato chips this nice and yellow and light because of the antioxidants? And what do the antioxidants do? Well, they reduce the serotonin level just like phenylalanine and turns your kids into schizophrenics. Then we have uh, colorants. Most of the foods, the drinks, everything, we find, we find colorants right now. They make them hyperactive, aggressive, and produce allergic reactions. That's all we need. Make our kids hyperactive. You know, the problem that kids are so out of control nowadays is because of the way we feed them, the way we, uh, we deal with them with all these uh, fast foods because it's so much easier to go and get something at a fast food store or, or just buy them a little bag of snacks and they will be happy. And then if you cook, it's fine. If you don't cook, they don't care either. And uh, so it's a wonderful way to live, isn't it? Now, most anything that comes in a bottle, in a box, or in a package, most everything contains toxic waste. And toxic waste, I call all these chemical additives. And with all these additives, these food items themselves turn into toxic waste. It's no food anymore. It is toxic waste. And what we need to do is we need to read the labels. We need to know what's in these foods. And, and if we don't want to do that, then just use natural foods. Use the foods the way they come from, um, from the farm. And the way God or nature produces the foods, eat them that way. Don't have them taken to a factory first where they will destroy a good part of the nutrients and then they will, um, then they will add a lot of toxins to it. Don't eat these kind of food. Now, currently, there are 50,000 chemicals in production. Of these, fewer than 1,000 have been investigated for their toxic effects. 55,000 chemicals. Now these chemicals are everywhere. They're in this carpet that's right here on the floor. They're in this stuff that is covering here, these, these, uh, uh, these furniture here. They're in the paint. They're everywhere. They're probably in these plants too if they're not natural. So they are everywhere. They are in our cleaning products. They're in our foods. They're everywhere. Now, 55,000 chemicals and less than 1,000 they have tested for their toxicity. So can you imagine how many toxins there got to be out there without anybody knowing that they will really hurt you? And research has shown that ultimately we have between 300 and 500 different chemicals in our body. Each one of us has these Toxins in our body, three to five hundred. We're not talking anymore of one or two. Three to five hundred toxins are in our bodies, and these toxins did not exist in the body of anybody before 1940. See, it happens to be that in 1940, that was the year when I was born. So when I was born, my mother didn't have these toxins in her body, and 
I did not have them in the body when I was born, but the mother that gives birth nowadays, she has these toxins in her body. And even though the placenta will protect the, the fetus uh, uh, um, from a lot of these toxins, but many of these toxins will also pass the placenta. And so these kids are already born with these toxins. It's a terrible situation. We can't keep living anymore as we used to. It will kill us. It will kill us like using winter clothes in Miami in the summer or using summer clothes in, in uh, Chicago in the winter. These, it will kill us if we do not adapt to these conditions on our planet Earth right now. From the underground to the stratosphere and beyond, dioxid and hundreds of other chemicals are intoxicating this planet Earth, our air, our water, our land, and everything. So, maybe now you will understand why I have a lot of people that come to me and they tell me, listen, I've kept all the the national standards of diet. I have never gone over anything and I get everything that the government here is recommending me to eat. And yet I got a cancer. Well, it's not enough. By the way, if you go by the standard standards of this, the, the uh, uh, daily allowances of this country, I guarantee you, you will get sick because that's what they're probably set up for. Anyway, so... Um, but I have other people, people that have been vegetarians and vegans for 20, 30 years. I just a month ago had somebody uh, who had been a vegan for 40 years, and now he suffers a stomach cancer. And people get all kinds of things, strokes, heart attacks, and uh, cancer, and, and all the rest of the diseases. And then they, how is it possible? I've been on such a good diet. Yes, you have been on a good diet that would have been good 70 years ago, but not anymore at this moment. We live in a different environment and we have to adapt to it. We need to make the changes in our lifestyle. We can't keep going like we are. And so what about all the chemicals and fertilizers that are in our foods that we get? A good question, too. Yes, well, can we stop eating? No, we can't stop eating. So do we have to eat it? Yes, we have to eat it. If there's nothing else, some of us have the money to buy organic and may be lucky that when you buy organic that it even is organic. So um, anyway, we have to keep eating. We can't avoid it. And uh, don't forget that there is a biological uh, scale, uh, uh, like the food chain in a place. Now, if you eat um, vegetables that contain uh, fungicides or pesticides, then you will only get less than a tenth of what you would get when you eat a piece of meat. Because these animals, they eat the same stuff. It's also contaminated, but it will accumulate in their in their, um, uh, in, in their organism. Let me explain it a little bit with, uh, let's start in the ocean, for example. There's that algae, algae swimming in the water, absorbing all the toxins all its life. Then comes a little fish and eats constantly the algae. Now the concentration in the algae is much higher than in the water. Now the little fish eats and eats and eats and eats all day long these little algaes. Now the concentration of the fish, it's much higher than in the, in the algae. And then the little fish is eaten by the big fish and he eats all the time these little fish. So now the big fish is, has a much higher concentration of uh, toxins than the, uh, the little fish. And then, the com then comes that fish with the two legs and hairs, and this fish eats the big fish then, and then we become uh, intoxicated in a tremendous way because we eat all the time these uh, uh, contaminated and intoxicated animals. So if you, the higher you go in the food chain, the, the more the toxicity will increase. So better eat some 
fumigated plants, if you can't afford organic food or if you can't produce it yourself, as I personally usually do, sometimes I can because I'm traveling too much, but uh, if you have to eat it, well, you got to eat it. It's just like breathing. I mean, you're breathing in here 150, 200, or maybe 300 different toxins. That's no matter where you are. It, it, it depends on where you are. And uh, so can you stop breathing? No, you can't stop breathing. You have to keep going because you wouldn't survive very long without breathing. Can you drink the water? Well, it contains chemicals too. It's very difficult to get them out. So most of us probably drink water with chemicals. Well, I guess it's better to dehydrate it than to, dry, to die of dehydration. So if there is no other choice, then we have to use what's available. And if you are a Christian, then you have the same advantage I have because I eat what I need to eat and I get the best I can and for the rest, I go to the Lord I am pray, and I pray over my food and I ask the Lord to cleanse this food and that it will not hurt and damage my body. And for the parts that still get into my body, then I do my uh, cleansing that I do all the time. Let's see, I do cleansing probably about uh, once every two months or so. I hope you will uh, change your mindset a little bit and uh, think about these things. And in our next lecture, we will be talking about what we need to think about in our body. Thank you. Thank you.